This is a line. It can bend and fold. Let's give it a direction. It has a head and a tail, and it's pretty long and thin. Something else that fits all of those characteristics is a snake. So let's call our line a snake. Not a mean snake, though, a nice one. Snakes don't like being exposed, so this snake is going to want to cow and coil into a nice curly coil. Let's look a little closer, shall we? Surely something as random as snake folding can't have that deep a rabbit hole attached. Before we do anything, we need to be good little mathematicians and rigorously define our terms. A snake is a curve, that is to say, a curvy line segment that has two ends, a head and a tail. Snakes are always just one line, never more. A snake can't cross itself. We don't want our poor snakes getting tied up into knots. Snakes can be divided up into segments, which are horizontal bits of snake. Snakes with vertical symmetry, that is to say, snakes that are flipped about a vertical line, are the same snake, but ones with horizontal symmetry are not. You must be able to draw a vertical line through all horizontal segments of a snake. So you can't cheat by doing this. This snake must cross itself, which means that it must be invalid. This rule also means that a snake cannot have two segments on the same layer. Here are some examples of valid snakes. And here are some examples of sad, invalid snakes. The natural first thing to do would be to think of some way to categorize and name snakes. There are a few ways that we could do this. Perhaps the most obvious one would be to just list the segments from top to bottom in a list. This snake is written 1, 3, 2, because the topmost snake layer contains the first snake segment, then the second snake layer, the third snake segment, and the third, the second snake segment. We may want a more robust snake naming scheme, however, so let's name our snakes going from head to tail and writing numbers based on which snaky layer the snake segment sits on, starting from zero at the bottom and going up as many snake levels as we need, like stories in a skyscraper. The snake that used to be written 132 in our old snake naming scheme is now written 201, because the snake's head occupies the topmost layer, 2, its second segment resides at the bottom, and its tail is in the middle at layer 1. An interesting note is that while us 3D snake folding enthusiasts can easily tell if two 2D snakes are different, that might not be the case for 2D snake folders. Take snake 43021 and 43012, for example. We can easily see the difference of the tails between 21 and 12. But a 2D observer who is face to face with the snake would be unable to tell, since they look the same from that angle. An observer from behind, however, could easily tell the difference between these two, but might get confused between the previously mentioned snake 43012 and the completely different snake 34012. This, I think, is an excellent way to gain a better appreciation for the fact that we are 3D beings and can fully identify a snake by ourselves. Here's something to get you thinking. Can you find the snake that would be called 0213? The answer is no. While all snakes have a name, not all names have a valid snake. A natural follow-up question would be, how can I determine whether a snake name is valid or not without just drawing the snake? It's very easy for a human to tell if a snake crosses itself, but any algorithm has a pretty hard time with it. We need to keep track of which segments connect to which other segments and on what sides. We might do something like this. Let's assume that the head is always facing left. The second segment, wherever that might be, creates a snaky barrier between the position of the head and the position of the next segment that runs along the right side. Any parts of the snake trying to move from a layer on one side of the barrier to the other are invalid. We can continue this with each connection, alternating left and right. 
There is no situation where a valid snake has two connections on the same side in a row. Using this snake algorithm, a snalgorithm, we can determine which snakes cross themselves. A natural follow-up question would be how many valid snakes are there with a given number of segments? Finding the number of snakes, valid or otherwise, is easy. That's just equal to the number of segments factorial. Calculating the number of valid ones is a little bit trickier though. Calculating the first few by hand, we get 1, 2 and 6. So we might think that it is the segments factorial too, but that's disproven with just one more segment. For there are 24 four-segmented snakes, but only 16 are valid. Let's quickly code up another snalgorithm to do this for us. It starts by using a recursive function to get every possible snake. We now need to weed out all the invalid ones, but there is a surprisingly elegant way to do it. Look at the first two segments of a snake and store them in an array for left-facing connections. Then go to the second segment and the third, marking that connection to the right. We can keep doing this for each connection we come across. The snake crosses itself when one of the numbers in a new connection is smaller than one of the numbers in a previous connection and greater than the other, but the other in the new connection isn't. Connections that have indexes that are both greater or both smaller are just in a different part of the snake. Those where one is greater than both and one is smaller than both in circular segment and one where both are greater than one and smaller than another are encircled. So this is the only situation where they could cause trouble. Let's ask our snalgorithm to figure out the number of valid snakes up to 10 segments. 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 6, 4, 16, 5, 50, 6, 144, 7, 462, 8, 1,392, 9, 4,536, and 10, 14,060. Interesting. It would appear that the proportion of invalid snakes grows drastically as the number of segments increases. With up to three segments, every single snake is valid. But once we get to 10, only about 0.4% of snakes are valid. I've gotten the snalgorithm to spit out an invalid 8-segment snake and a valid 8-segment snake, just to make sure it really is working. It's given us 10765243 as our valid snake, a very nice snake indeed, and 6742051 as our invalid snake, which does also appear to be correct. This poor snake is very, very tangled. Let's go back and look at those numbers again. They may seem a bit random, and that's because they are. This is actually an open problem in mathematics. There doesn't seem to be a way to predict the next number of valid snakes without just testing every single one. Although this problem goes by the rather more boring premise of folding paper rather than snakes, but it's still very interesting. While we don't know the function that the snakes use to grow for certain, we know it must always be less than or equal to the number of segments factorial, since the number of valid snakes can't exceed the number of total snakes. And we know it must always be greater than or equal to 2 to the power of the number of segments minus 1, since a snake can always go in at least two directions, exactly one space up or one space down. Saying that gives me an idea. If you have a system where you can have a theoretically infinitely long list, and we have a series of things that can be in one of at least two states, that means that we can write a binary with this. Let's say that each new segment represents the previous segment multiplied by two. If it coils up, it's multiplied by one. Otherwise, it's multiplied by zero. The total number of the snake is equal to the sum of all its segments. So this would be 0, this is 1, this is 2, and so on. Here's 0 through 15 as snakes. Some interesting patterns emerge when we perform operations on these snakes. Because each segment represents double the previous, to double a snake number 
Just flip it around and add this little bit on top. This way, every segment will have been moved to being the next segment, so double the value. In the same vein, even snakes, those that are divisible by two, will have this bit already there, and removing it and flipping it around is how you halve a snake. A fun byproduct of this, by the way, is that even snakes always have their heads on the top, and odd ones always have their heads at the bottom. Multiplying by four is even easier. No need to flip any snakes. Simply add this shape to the top of a snake. You might notice that this times four shape is just two of the times two shapes stacked on top of each other. In fact, multiplying by any power of two is super easy, since they're all just many stacked times two pieces. Let's try something else. Look at the nine snake. This snake can be expressed as zero, four, three, one, two. But hang on, those are all numbers which can be expressed as snakes too. So really, the nine snake can be written like this, except all these snakes can be written as more snakes too. And we can keep iterating this process until every single snake is represented by only the zero snake, the one snake, and the two snake. It's like the world's weirdest and least efficient form of binary, or I suppose ternary. Here's another interesting thing you can do with snakes. Remember, every segment can be used to store at least two values, and they come in a set order. The snake is like a long tape of ones and zeros, which means it's perfect for a Turing machine. The head of the Turing machine begins from the head of the snake and folds it up, going back and forth across the snake's theoretically infinite length, coiling it up into a shape to run a bit of code. Why program in Python when you can program with Pythons?